am starting record. I'm just waiting for Facebook to come online. Do you want to introduce us? Sure. <laughs> this is my first time, folks. That's not. Yes, it is. Is it? Yeah, this format for sure. This looks being a bit funny. Um, maybe we start and as you guys are going, I will just keep playing with the Facebook thing to get it all up and running. So, um, are we live? We are recording. So what I'll do is chop off the beginning part of this recording and I've let everyone into the room so we can go. Okay, so do you want to introduce us? Good evening, everybody, and thank you for joining us this evening. Um, my name is Sarah Hallett, and I'm here to introduce Maria Fidel Regueros, John, um, well, Roland Gantz, John J. Cobra, and uh, Johann Stegmann, who are two artists who have participated in this exhibition that Maria has curated for the Meta Foundation um, and in collaboration with August House. The exhibition is uh, both a physical exhibition and it has a virtual rendering of itself. The physical exhibition is at August House and will run until the 29th of November. There is also a curatorial walkabout on Saturday for anyone who would like to join. Um, and the exhibition is divided up into a series of acts which Maria is going to walk through and this is act one. So the title of this conversation is act one strategies of being. So I will hand over to you guys to take us through the conversation. Um, good evening. Uh, hi, Roland. Hi, Johan and hi, Sarah. Uh, Sarah, thank you very much for hosting this um, webinar panel discussion in a sense, a very intimate panel discussion that is. Um, the focus of it is around the concept of um, the show, uh, an exhibition in several acts, a, le a lexigram of ideas. And um, the thinking behind it was to showcase artists that are currently at August House, of which a selection of six artists was um, done uh, in association with Krista D, uh, who is a master's student at Wits University in curating and with the support of Sarah Hallett. And the, the concept centered around, um, because there were similarities and there were broad differences between artists and their practice, um, the idea was to look at the exhibition as a conversation, almost uh, emulating a social encounter that you would at a party or uh, at a friend's house or in a professional environment or at an exhibition space, anywhere. Um, that uh, you, as an individual, maneuvers through uh, those convers well, a conversation and other conversations with other people. So um, each conversation was in essence grouped uh, um, under the auspices of an act, uh, again alluding to the somewhat theatrical rendition of, of the show. Um, and uh, each act had a title. And the first act is called Strategies of Being. Uh, where Johann uh, Stegmant and Roland Kunst, aka John K. Cobra, uh, participate. Um, the second act is called uh, Monologues and Contemplations, where um, two uh, female artists from August House, namely Nyakalo Maleke and Grace Mukalapa, uh, are showcased. And the third and the final act is called Metamorphosis which uh, includes um, Nyakalo Maleke, Yo uh, John K. Cobra, Bambo Sibia, and Percy. Uh, so yeah, this is the first talk and it focuses on strategies of being. 
Um, the thinking behind strategies of being, in essence, was uh, kind of coagulating both artists' practices, which, in essence, provide, um, from their perspective and from my understanding, kind of proposed and implemented strategies of, of occupying space, time, and, and that being their kind of practice through the narratives that they, um, they have created. So without much ado, I wanted to, um, in essence, showcase uh, slightly the uh, first act through a prism, I guess, which is a fish-eyed lens of how we had um, placed the act. And what you see in front of you are, in essence, uh, works by uh, John K. Cobra and Johann Stegmann. John K. Cobra is on the right-hand side and Johann is on the left-hand side. Um, so, you're, uh, Roland, um, can you speak a little bit about your work and your practice within the context of, of um, the title, uh, I guess, Strategies of Being, because a lot of your work uh, speaks around ideas of uh, hybridity. It brings in the concept of Afropeanism and those elements and moments, in essence, are very much what your practice is about. So can you tell and acquaint the audience um, with what your practice tends to, to focus on and how? Okay, so maybe to start, I would, uh, first of all, thank you for inviting me for this uh, discussion. Um, I must say that my work is uh, primarily um, autobiographical. Uh, bi biographical, sorry for my English because I'm uh, French and Dutch speaking originally. But uh, so I have Congolese roots from DRC and Kinshasa and I have Belgium roots. And throughout my life, um, cultural and genetical roots. So I'm a mixed race, let's say, even if I don't like the term race, but it's just to use a term that is uh, recognizable for the, for the audience. audience. So I was, my life, my identity has been shaped by the fact that I'm half white, half black. But throughout my life, I realized that when you're mixed race, you're, uh, yeah, you, you live through, um, through um, you look at the world through a Western, from a Western pers perspective, but also from Western as big, let's say Belgian perspective and then a, a Congolese perspective. But throughout your life, you have to redefine your position between these two poles in your life that uh, create uh, the ensemble of your being, which is one extreme pole, which is being uh, white and, and Flemish, and the other extreme pole is being black and Congolese. And throughout the life uh, of a mixed race person, you have to navigate and to reposition your uh, your identity according to these uh, two extremes. Sometimes you feel more Congolese, sometimes you feel more African. While the external world has always tried to categorize me and to put me in a box of either black or white. I have no problem with my uh, uh, white and black ancestry. I love both of them as much as I love my parents who are white and black. But the thing is, um, at the essence, I'm a hybrid being. And I think that as a human being, uh, there are two main perspectives to, to define yourself. Either you say that you live in, in many worlds where the world defines you because they um, define your identity, uh, your position economically, culturally, who you are uh, according to that a certain community or world. The second positioning is that you consider yourself as being the center of the world and at the intersection of many communities, identities, influences. And this is for me the center of every um, work I develop. And like you said, hybridity, 
describe that that that, that uh, say that that intersection of cultures, genes, biology, uh, his his history. I mean, and I think that this topic has been following through my whole life. And and I, before I saw it as a uh, as a handicap because the people couldn't categorize me as being biracial or bicultural and give me that etiquette of being a hybrid, a fluid being adapting to different circumstances, to different cultural backgrounds, communities, like all people do in this world. But then, because the, the thing is, when you're not confronted, we're not questioned about your identity, you not really realize that at the essence, you're also a hybrid being. You navigate through different social communities, spaces. Uh, you have to, to reshape your identity, your position, positioning, the way you speak according to the people you interact with. So in my work, if you look at this um, installation, um, I've been looking, uh, now in my research, I've been researching for more than uh, 12 years to come at this stage where I am researching the concept of fluid identities. I start working with mediums, material that, uh, that have um, as much symbolic value in European um, cultures as in African cultures. And for example, the, 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 the importance of hair and uh, how hair and hairdresses has been used as attribute, as uh, symbolic objects to to uh, to say that to 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 install your 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 your, your position socially, politically, economically, according to a certain hairdress, you can uh, express your identity and just uh, place yourself in the world and define who you are. So I'm working with like with wigs of uh, hair, but also with rubber. And rubber is one of the materials, natural um, resources that's been uh, used and, and uh, produced, sorry, in, in Congo since, let's say, before the colonization of Congo by uh, the Belgium. Uh, and throughout the Belgian colonization, they've been using rubber as a substance to, to, to impose a dominant um, Western perspective on Congo defining Congo, creating a colony with, uh, by categorizing also the people into different segments of society, uh, a small elite white uh, block, then you have down the, 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 the pyramid, different layers of white people according to their social class, and then under the black people and other foreigners from um, other, uh, communities from Africa. But so, Rubber has been used, of caoutchouc in France, has been used as a natural substance, especially during the, the reign of uh, King Leopold II. Sorry, am I maybe elaborating? I'm almost uh, done. I just want to explain the historical importance uh, 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 of, of rubber. When you look at, at uh, the Kingdom of Belgium, thanks to the production of rubber during uh, the, the reign of King Leopold II, he was able to build a beautiful infrastructure and an urbanistic um, vision all over the certain main cities, uh, central cities of, uh, of, of Belgium. And through that way, it was possible to transport Belgium uh, to a level of uh, a top industrial uh, country because of the production of rubber, etc., and other aspects, of course, that I can't discuss now. But so rubber is a substance that has been used by many Western countries. For example, the big demand of rubber was initiated by the fact that cars were uh, for commercial uh, and a broader use were um, built, so they need tires. So thanks to tires made from rubber from Congo, the Western world has uh, had an opportunity to be developed and to, to, uh, uh, to enhance transportation uh, possibilities, which helps the economical world, etc. So rubber on itself also is a medium full of potential that is possible to use in a very constructive way. 
not anymore referring to domination and colonialism and even neo -cap uh, capitalism, sorry, or neo colonialism. And uh, from a perspective of uh, Western world or of businesses or for multinationals or spe uh, speculators want to, wanting to use just black bodies and, and substances created and, 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 and produced in, in Africa just to, to develop big profits for themselves. Rubber can also be used as a medium to convey a certain uh, Afropean perspective on the world and a hybrid perspective of identity, um, life, and more. So the sculpture, the installation you see now is in fact a reflection on uh, social structures. How it's possible to combine these central uh, symbols of power that uh, have been used uh, and, and, and by many European and, and, and African nations and communities to convey a certain um, status, social, economically, politically, and so on. And by combining these elements, you create like a very solid construction that has almost the appearance of marble. And, but in reality, um, once you melt rubber, you get back to the sense of the essence of life, which is fluidity, liquidity. Being at the intersection of many worlds and perspectives and moving around, being the center and the whole, the rest of the world is moving around you. So. Roland, can I um, also interject here? Uh, the name of Kwanga also, as far as I understood from you and through some research, um, is also the name of uh, a bread, Correct. Um, yeah. kind of uh, almost the, 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 yeah, the brand of a bread in uh, DRC. So that too has a particular kind of role, uh, I mean, through its title. Mm -hmm. and, and it's interesting because of this, in a sense, um, multiple meaning that uh, the, this work uh, um, resonates. I mean, uh, Kwanga bars meaning that they also look like loaves of bread, but at the same time emulating, you know, structures of, of uh, museums and, and those two in your work were, um, again, kind of created as a proposal to a particular kind of culmination of, of, of hybridity right. and, and multi multitude of identities and understandings of identities am i am i am i right you're totally right in fact at, at the basis of my work at this phase in my research i look at um, what is called a uh, space of correlation which means it's like uh, like i said the human beings are at the intersection of many worlds identity etc you can also have material and immaterial culture or materials, mediums that are at the intersection of many worlds. So when you look at uh, just at, at, at uh, European and African uh, societies, and a lot of them use like their daily nourishments as a shape, as almost in a shape of a, a bread. Like in, in Europe, we know the, the, the typical bread, it can be French bread, whatever, Italian bread, but let's say, the, 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 the fact that it's like a, a combustible, uh, uh, a fuel, fuel for, to energize the human body. But you have the same concept in Africa, concepts in Africa, like for example, in Congo, you have kwanga. Kwanga is the typically, a typical bread that people use uh, daily. And it has the same qualities as kwanga, as rubber. So I'm combining the, the concept of the possibilities of, the, of nourishment of European bread with Congolese bread who, that also have many other uh, variations all over Africa. Congo is made of, um, of manioc, what is cassava, uh, meal, meal is in English? Yeah, yeah. cassava. Yeah, cassava. Uh, and uh, once you, you prettify it with water, it's like polenta, it becomes solid. Mm. Same mm. with bread. But mm. 
when you liquefy again, it's possible to, to, to make it fluid again, then you can reshape it to any other form that, that you want. So I'm looking at these kind of spaces of cor uh, correlations where there is a potential to build something that overcomes any categorization uh, based on race, ethnicity, social, um, socially, nationalities, <laughs> etc. Mm -hmm. Kwanga bread for me is a fuel that could be in, a, in an abstract way, could be consumed by beings, by human beings, to, to liquefy their identity again, their body, literally. Mm -hmm. And to bring it back to the essential state of human beings, which is being a liquid, a liquid state, being at the, at the epicenter of many worlds and identities and the possibility to reshape yourself and to question yourself and to go through process of regeneration of questioning your position, your identity, uh, what's, how you look at the world around you, etc. So there is always, I, I believe that human life lives in a cycle, cyclic uh, process mm -hmm. from, a, from a, a, a very short solid state when you define your identity and who you are and your perspective, uh, perception of the world and other people for a, a very short brief moment. After that, you, you go to a liquefying uh, liquid state again because you're reflecting on everything you're encountering in your life and reshaping your position and your position towards these different elements and spaces and, and faces that surrounded you, you personally, but also conceptually, ideologies, etc. Yeah. So life is a really process from liquid to solid to liquid. And this is artwork is representing that single, that small moment of, uh, of solidity where you define a social architecture based on a very sol solid and, and, and material that transcend any, any form of categorization. You have um, you have gone into a lot more um, the detail because um, part of what I wanted to ask you at a later point was around the material. Um, but thank you very much for this um, presentation because. Um, yeah, it definitely grounds um, the research-based uh, focus of your practice too, um, and how integrated your autobiographical moments are in 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 it. Johan, on kind of picking up on certain terms uh, that um, Roland just mentioned. I mean, you know. Um, he's talking about the intersections. Um, I think that a lot of your work is very much about the intersections, but at the same time around the omissions of uh, certain historical facts. And at the same time, those omissions um, are almost um, used as, um, as causes in a sense for, for, for you to explore how to I guess, integrate your perspective in, in your work. And you, on the other hand, um, are using um, more two-dimensional uh, type work. Um, it's, it's focused in a more traditional medium uh, that is etching um, and uh, scale tends to speak a lot um, about these hidden moments that um, uh, you almost elicit the audience to look for. Um, and um, again, this, do you, well, you speak to you about your work with referencing such terms as duality through our discussions and um, can you elaborate conceptually what your work um, aims to achieve um, and, and do you think it's a fair submission to, to, to place you in, 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 in this act of, of strategies of being? Um. Yes. Sorry, it's an elaborate question. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna roll with it. <laughs> so, um, 
first of all, uh, hi everyone, and thanks for for this opportunity. Um, maybe let me just while um, while a bunch of these thoughts are in my head around what Roland said, I'll I'll highlight a few things that that I find interesting, and then kind of uh, segue them into answering your question. So one thing I almost want to ask Roland um, this question. So what I find interesting about the Kwanga Bar's work is that I thought I was convinced that it's marble. And also from looking at some of his other works, I understood that that shape kind of represented almost like this monument of, of Afropeanism. And so then I was kind of surprised when in real life, when I was there, I realized, oh, it's rubber. And I'm, I'm in, interested to know if that like moment of the audience uh, realizing, oh, it's actually not this solid state, it's actually closer to this more fluid kind of state is something that you wanted to like say on purpose. Um, like, is that something you, you wanted to elicit in the audience, that kind of thing of thinking, oh, it's very solid, but actually it's more fluid. Kind of thing. Certainly, yes. In fact, it depends how the light falls into is, is, is projected on the on, on the piece, but it can look very solid and 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 like classical buildings, almost uh, very bombastic and heavy. But at yes. the end, I want people to, just to see how light and 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 the possibility of it when it's lighter and you can reshape it and 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 it's like a rubber bar; you can bend it. Hmm. You wouldn't think that from far, but uh, yeah, certainly. Yeah, so so actually, that's something I I, I like, um, and it's similar to some of the work that I'm trying to do. Where I like the idea of the audience looking at it, and the first time you see the image, because of this kind of very classical style, um, very kind of Eurocentric. Um, uh, etchings. Uh, I wouldn't say this work in particular does it as much as perhaps like these ones that are referencing uh, classic etchings. And um, I like this idea of someone looking at my work and, and the, the first assumption uh, draws also similarly on something that we perceive to be more solid, more eternal, more uh, authoritative. And then when you investigate it closer, you realize, uh, oh, but it's actually fallible. It doesn't make sense. This cannot be historically correct. No, no, no. And then um, it actually, in that way, it becomes, uh, it's actually supposed to be more fluid. It's supposed to be a more um, open to what you see in the image. Um, and then ultimately, like, uh, like you mentioned, Maria history, the, the idea is that even just on that first kind of surface level, I would like the, the audience member to go through that exercise that you should actually be going through with all uh, classical Eurocentric images is you, sh you shouldn't fall for that kind of trap of history class where you kind of are taught history and you learn it like this thing that is, this happened and this happened and that's what it means. It's actually, um, I mean, if you just think of five people going to a party and afterwards telling each other about that event, they can't even give exactly the same version of Saturday night. So, so, so much more with major important historical events. It's a completely fluid and subjective um, thing, actually. And I like, I like the idea of engaging with history um, creatively and somehow through this very non-correct um, approach uh, you you end up kind of finding something that's that's true as much as it's almost it can be a very true kind of engagement with history while it might not be um, historically correct so to say um, so yeah so just that thing of thinking the thing is very solid and it's it's probably this very like typical uh, consolidated thing and then realizing oh it's actually it's actually more fluid it's more fragile it's more um, it's more in, in transition uh, yeah I, I like that a lot 
And then I think the, the thing about Roland's work that I find very interesting is, well, I mean, it kind of touches on the same thing in a way, it's this idea of hybridism and fluidity. I think um, it's interesting to, to look how, at how our approaches to that is different. So uh, my background, obviously I come from a much more um, typical privileged white middle-class suburban kind of background. Um, privileged in the sense of uh, ignorant to, to that idea that you are actually a fluid being because you are more comfortable in a position of a particular kind of identity. Um, and so the way I came about being interested in identity um, and developing actually strategies of being and strategies of um, presenting myself and, and dissecting my identity, it actually came about in a roundabout way. My interest was first of all in making good art. And I found that I resonated with work that, that had some form of um, duality in it. And, you know, I was, uh, I was very much disillusioned by this, uh, the, the typical way of thinking I was taught in, in school and the way that people talk about history and about actually about everything and realizing that um, there's such a close correlation for me between a, a work being powerful and beautiful and it being non-didactic, it, it not being resolved, it not being like this is what it means and this is the answer. It's as if when a work does that, it almost feels to me as if it falls flat. And, and so, yeah, my interest was in making work that, that can be two opposing things at the same time, that can be um, right according, or according to a particular point of view, right and wrong at the same time. And, and I must be able to believe both point of views kind of at the same time. So some of my earlier interests was to, uh, and it still is to a great extent, is to make work where I identify something that would be a bad idea from an artistic point of view. So the idea is if you do this, the art's going to be bad. And then I tell myself, well, what if I do it so bad that it becomes good? And so, <laughs> and so that would be interesting because that would be dualistic. So my initial idea was, sure, I'd really like to tell South African stories in a classical Eurocentric uh, etching painting language. And of course, that's a terrible idea because you would be perpetuating this. I, I mean, even if you were to be able to tell a historical story perfectly and you were able to give the balanced perspective and blah, 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 which is impossible. But even if you were able to do that, then you would just perpetuate the idea that something is only true when it's in a Eurocentric kind of language, which is a, which is a terrible misunderstanding a lot of people still have. And so then I thought, well, what if I do this bad idea so bad that it becomes uh, not that bad, it becomes the opposite. And so by kind of indulging that really bad idea to the point of it ridiculing itself and becoming fallible, um, I found that it became something, something, first of all, that's not as problematic, but also that I find a lot more interesting. And it, it led me to, to kind of, um, to, to have very fruitful and interesting kind of interactions with history. Um, so, you know, I ended up making work that, that deals with, or allows me to put myself in a space where I deal with very important um, problematic elements of my own heritage. But I would not have been able to get to that place if, if I just read the textbook that already has the answer. Um, it's like you, you have to like really throw yourself out there and engage. And, um, and so then the last thing that I want to mention that's kind of along the same route is following this whole idea of doing the bad thing so bad. <laughs> um, when I, uh, I, I grew up in 
partially in Pretoria and in Petersburg, which became Polokwane in Limpopo province, and I studied in Pretoria. So um, my life up until the end of university was very much on the north side of what they call the Boudevors Gorde, which is like the very white Afrikaans um, area of South Africa in a way, well, compared to Joburg. And so then I moved to Joburg through an interest in art. And when I moved here, I was, I was definitely not what you would call the most white Afrikaans guy ever. I was a lot more, um, I would say relative to my peers, kind of um, loose cannon, open-minded kind of person, as far as the typical stereotype of the identity goes. But then when I moved to Johannesburg and made a lot of uh, friends of different backgrounds and colors and creeds and had a lot of like interesting discussions with people expanding my perspectives on cultures and point of views, I realized that approaching someone as the token white Afrikaans person was not a handicap as I thought it was. Um, now to again steal a word from Roland. Um, it was actually, it was actually a strength because when you you out of that context and you are now kind of seen as this uh, overtly white Afrikaans person, you have a lot richer, a uh, lot more rich interaction with people. Um, you kind of present a case that is not the essence of who you are, but you are it's kind of an extreme where you come from that exists in a context that you were before. And you're asked to kind of uh, explain it or at least um, represent it in some form. And then the opposing point of view is uh, represented to you so much more clearly. And by having a conversation with someone, you, you suddenly um, reach a point where you can kind of acknowledge their point of view and they can acknowledge yours. Um, and I feel like both persons walk away kind of reinforced in a positive way in their, in their own identity, or at least in an understanding of where they come from and an understanding of where other people come from. So, so then I decided eventually, and it's actually like very recently that I decided to cut my hair short and accentuate my beard and stuff almost as like a creative choice in my practice to, to present myself, even sometimes in some of my work as the worst of the worst Afrikaans person. So for example, this work we're looking at here is called Death on a Pale Male. So um, in the context of this particular body of work, the idea was um, imagine you take a bunch of uh, very white Afrikaans people and you, you throw them in the city center of Johannesburg on horses, kind of like tourists. And uh, again, you have this very overt kind of representation or, or this, you, you confront the identity quite overtly. And then this particular image was playing with the idea of, um, are we the tourists or are we the apocalypse or whatever? So um, here I kind of, represent myself almost like like uh, the worst of the worst kind of thing. And um, I find it's very useful and it's actually a very interesting route for me for perhaps for two reasons. The one is that if you think about what white Afrikaans identity actually is, you realize it's, it's an identity built around an identity crisis because there's no other African identity that has found it necessary to, to make their name literally mean African. And, <laughs> and that's what Afrikaners, um, that's what Afrikaner means. And I mean, it gets even worse when you, when you delve into it and you realize that it's a, it's a, a very recent, Truly, the true Afrikaner identity is actually a multiracial identity that is majority mixed race. Um, but there was quite recently um, uh, actually this artificial severing of the 
colored component of it. And this very brutal kind of like forcing actually in a way, this idea that Afrikaans means white. And it's only also very recently that I started changing the way of speaking, at least in my mind, that I talk about white Afrikaans because that whole identity has got so much work to do on itself, actually, <laughs> that in the future, you know, the more Afrikaans identity will, will kind of um, grow and reconcile itself with itself, the more it will realize that the white component of it is actually a subset of it. It's not actually the, <laughs> the main man. Um, so, so I think the, the identity itself is inherently so interesting that it's, um, and it's so filled with duality that it's actually a very fruitful uh, medium almost for me to explore. So that's why I find it good to bring it in story. Yes, sorry. No, no, no. I'm, I kind of want to add to, to what you're saying and, 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 and ask a question. Um, can you elaborate a little bit about the necessity to introduce um, in a lot of your titling, for instance, um, the Afrikaans? Do you feel that um, it is, um, uh, apart from potentially uh, providing some kind of nuances, do you think that also it, it, it endeavors into providing some possibilities of, of interpreting the work? Um, yes, yes, definitely. Because death of pale, death on a pale male is not beer, beerly. Yeah, beerly. Billy, um... Um, it, it's, <laughs> the nuances and 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 the the again, I guess duality or, or, or extra uh, information exactly. here. Um, that, does it have significance? Yeah. So. Um, uh, Okay, one reason that I do this uh, thing is, is humor. I feel like um, humor is not the end goal of what I'm doing, but often uh, if there's humor, it's almost like a positive signpost for me that I'm, I'm working in a good direction because if something is humorous, that is typically an indication that you are dealing with something and you are able to kind of digest it. Um, so that's often a, a good sign uh, thing for me. So. Initially, I just found it really funny, um, this idea of uh, giving a translation for my English title, but then just giving a completely different title, actually, although it is a title for this work. So in a way, it's, it is a translation, but it, it's, not a, it's not a translation in the conventional sense of, of the thing. And, but I think, um, the more I do it, the more interesting I find it because um, it definitely brings in uh, different perspectives and stuff. So it's like, um, um, well, in this case, death on a pale male, Billy is like slang for like a tough guy kind of thing. So, you know, I, I feel like dissatisfied with the title that is so like, um, that I have to put another spin on it. So death on a pale male almost feels like, oh yes, that's a very good description of this work. Wow, that is so like he's facing the apocalypse or something. And then Billy is like, oh, well, actually he's kind of proud about it. He doesn't even care or something like that. So it, it puts it on, a, on a, a different spin. And to me, if there, there has to be different opinions um, in the same image, you know, it's like, I'm trying to, to hybridize things. I don't want this, um, this uh, didactic one way of looking at an image. Um, oh, and also just something I wanna mention. Um, the, the whole translation of Afrikaans to English and the whole um, ideas around Afrikaans identity, you know, it has a lot to do with, um, with uh, this aspirational aspect of the identity crisis of being white Afrikaans. So um, the traditionally uh, white Afrikaners have always fought a kind of culture battle against their uh, English counterparts. And it's this idea that, um, you know, there's a cultural hierarchy, which is a completely flawed and horrible idea actually, but there's this hierarchy of 
English or European, and then um, Afrikaans, and then African. And, um, and for me, uh, it's, it's very useful and healthy to kind of realize that, you know, actually, um, the, the, that I, I love both. Um, and the one is not better than the other one. And more specifically, like with the translation, you know, the, the messed upness and the kind of peculiarity of this situation where this identity has wedged itself in um, is actually what makes it nice in the first place. It, it would not have been what it was if it wasn't um, kind of in that, that uh, unresolved state. Um, so a lot of Afrikaans which was taught to me in this very serious formal way, because they were with nationalism trying to say that you can go to space with Afrikaans and you can do science with Afrikaans. So they were trying to make it more and more like aspirationally up that pyramid. But then you realize some of the essence of really fundamental old Afrikaans has always been just to have a laugh and to make a, a bad version of a proper language that was like, for example, um, the Afrikaans word for, for leopard is leipart, which is a ridiculous word. It means lazy horse. And it's so clear as day to me now that that word comes from an Afrikaans guy hearing an English person say leopard and making his own humoristic joke version of that word, going lazy horse, ha, ha, ha. And then that became the official freaking name of the animal. So, so the more you kind of let go of this, um, this, you know, fake ideas in your head of superiority and blah, blah, blah. And, um, the more, the more you actually, could, it's also something that I realized, um, when I engage with the history, um, the more you go outside of your comfort zone, the more you are willing to hear the other side of the story, especially of fellow South African identities, the more you become solidified in your, well, not solidified, but you become more comfortable with your identity because you discover more and more of that which is good of it and that of it that you can move forward with. And you discover more and more of how it's so intertwined with other South African Indian identities um, and how there's, there's no reason to want to stay in the lager, which is this kind of typical endogamic response that, that white Afrikaans people have out of fear, this, this self victim complex, which is so ridiculous because <laughs> they're not the victims at all. So, um, um, I want to take you a couple of steps back. You um, you spoke about hierarchy, and I want to kind of uh, take it to um, to Roland for a second. Roland, in this um, in this work, which is incredibly striking, uh, called Afropean series, Flandria, uh, you superimposed um, to, in a sense, regal figures, um, and again, using um, public archives uh, in an attempt to create another way of looking. And again, for me, that was a, a presentation of a, a strategy. Um, can you speak a little bit about the work and also its medium? Because it is a, a, a digital print, which is a very contemporary uh, format uh, on, on metallic silver paper, which again can be alluded to a very old um, old approach to, to, to printing and photography. But again, it's about this dual play. Um, and after that, I would like to again invite Johan to perhaps speak to, to the work that is adjacent to it in, in our presentation, um, which is again about presenting something and, and and being told that the, the intended narrative, in fact, is flawed, uh, and you're very openly cancelling your own um, artwork, in a sense. So, uh, yeah, Roland, can I can I ask you to speak to this work and 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 its intention? Mm -hmm. 
You know, but like I explained in the beginning, I'm a bicultural. In fact, when I don't like the, the, the term biracial, but let's say I have so I have a Congolese mother and a Belgian father, a Flemish father. So uh, I speak Dutch and it's quite, uh, I mean, we have the same origins with the Netherlands in that way. When you speak about Afrikaners and their language, that is for me sometimes very hard to understand. But certain uh, dialects, I don't know. I don't know how it comes that sometimes I do understand more than other dialects or pronunciation. No, but the thing is, so like I said, I grew up um, developing like a, 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 a European perspective, a Belgian perspective, a Flemish perspective towards the world, but also a Congolese perspective towards the world. So basic, but also besides of that, I have a third identity, main identity. I'm uh, at the basic and super mulatto or metiso or... Um, this is my, my main identity. Mixing these two uh, traditions, culture, two different cultural traditions, perspective of life, expectations, value system, and so on. So I can talk with, just to simplify the thing, with white people and really see an, a feeling from their perspective, their concerns, but I can just do the same with uh, black people or African people. While they probably, doubt if I'm able to do that, but I, it's just how I grew up. So when I present in my artworks, I was speaking about uh, spaces of correlations. In fact, I'm looking for similar concepts who have been developed separately and on different continents in Europe and in Africa. But at that, so like I said, they are similar, but they have uh, developed for many years, centuries separately. But at the end, when you bring them together, you recognize basic universal principles of how people uh, develop a society and creating uh, hierarchy systems and so on based on certain recognizable elements. You know, the way you, you, you have a, your, the, your hairdress, the shape it has, what kind of fabric you use, how you drape fabric, uh, how you present and portray present yourself, the, the, the way you, you, you hold your body, etc. Now, what I want to do in my work is when they look at my work, I want, in, in fact, to, I want them to recognize archetypes, similar shapes that has been developed in these two different continents and that you can see, still find throughout the history. Of course, there is more known about European history and people use uh, art history references and, and other uh, documentation and, and sources just to point out or to give the impression that Europe developed culture had a more rich and developed culture than, than, uh, than Africa. But when you look at the history of uh, Europeans and Africans, we have common ancestors in Africa. So civilization was developed for the, the first form of developed community system with political uh, institutes that so were developed in Africa. And after that, they were transmitted and migrated to the, uh, towards the rest of the world. I don't want to say that your Africans are at the end smarter and more intelligent and, and more complex from origin. It's just how evolution happened and migration has spread uh, now in a circular way knowledge. So in my work, I, I look from an, mainly from an African European perspective at the world. So I look back at the history of a relationship that has been developed between Africans and Europeans since the birth of men in Africa and the great migrations. And how uh, in Europe, especially after 1500, there were Africans, um, there were Europeans in Africa, and, and when I speak about Congo, the Portuguese were in Africa who were, came in contact with the great kingdom of Congo and uh, got in contact with very interesting uh, political system, etc. At the same time, around 1500s, um, uh, African also went to Europe and there were presence in different layers of society. They had different social, economical and political position. 
So for example, we had uh, characters like um, Christopher de Moor, which was uh, an archer at the court of Charlemagne. I mean, being at the court of Charlemagne is like being at the court of Genghis Khan or, uh, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's, so Europe, all over Europe, you had black people being blacksmiths. They were slaves, but as much as they were white slaves, uh, you had artists, intellectuals, writers, uh, generals. I mean, um, the famous, yeah, I'm not gonna elaborate maybe too far, but just when you look at this picture, it's a digital collage. So I went to the internet. I consider that the internet, the online world is just a prolongement of the physical world and the mystical world. And I selected on the internet certain um, um, paintings from uh, the Renaissance in Europe, where uh, sometimes they did portray black people in certain uh, positions as uh, uh, and within the, the lower nobility and so on. Uh, but also, like you see here, it's a combination of two um, two um, images. It's a painting from Roger van der Weyen, a painting from the Renaissance depicting a lady. Uh, I don't know the correct term in, in, in English, but it's from a higher uh, social um, status. And uh, combined with a picture of uh, a Congolese woman with facial scarification that was taken during the early uh, colonization. I mean, photos of that painting are now public uh, property. So I can use it freely. The picture of that African woman is still under uh, auteur rights. You still have to pay auteur rights for it. Without even knowing if the, the, the auteur of that picture is still alive, but you still have companies who so-called um, manage the rights uh, to use this picture. I didn't even ask them the permission to use that, that picture because, I mean, this is African ancestry property. They take, took pictures of black people in a time where these black bodies were colonized and now think they can still uh, earn money with these images. I think it's totally immoral. So I just picked this picture from the internet and made that, uh, that collage. Because I think as being an, uh, from African ancestry, it is my right to use these images and to present them in a context that gives uh, a true, a more true narrative to the meaning of these uh, um, uh, pictures. And not only a picture from uh, uh, a so-called primitive society in Congo with head scarifications that are a, a very primitive way of uh, body decoration, etc. It's more complex than that, but I'm coming to there. So what I wanted to do is, like I said, around 1500, the Renaissance, but also African speaking being more and more present in Europe, I wanted to point um, out that moment in history, but also integrate into that the contact from Europe with Africa through imperialism and the colonization of Congo. And, and to try to represent an, a, a being of the future, an hybrid being of the future, like an Afro-European person who would wear on her face proofs of her or, um, or uh, of her African origins. I talked about the birth of men in Africa and then the big, the big migrations. And like you see here, it's, I wanted to, com to, to, to combine all these, uh, the way of portraying um, and varying elements, uh, dress, you know, certain dressing codes and to represent an, an elevated human being socially, but also mentally, very aware of its origins. And the idea is that out of that white face of that Flemish lady around 1500, pops out these heads of facial scarifications. Just referring to the fact that human beings at, at the end, uh, intersection of so many histories, they can't just say, I'm partly, uh, if, I, <laughs> if I, I, I take down, every bar barrier and frontier, I could say I'm partially Chinese just because of the common origin we have. 
But of course, there is the whole question about cultural appropriation, but I'm not going to go there. But the thing is that um, when you look at uh, what people don't understand in Europe, I also wanted to explain them is that there is more known about European history and, uh, and the code of, uh, code of arms and how people from nobility and how people just uh, portrayed were carry elements, objects that would um, convey what their social political status and economic, economical status was. And they consider that this clothing, this type of clothing, the way the, that woman is wearing that um, piece of tissue, I don't know how to say in English, whatever. According to um, an old practice that also exists in the, 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 the Yombe, which is one of the ethnical groups of Congo, my mother is a Yombe, they brought this uh, scarification on their, uh, on their face because their idea was when you're born and you only have like a, a flat skin, it's considered as being a, um, the natural state of human beings. But once you bring this scarification, you cultivate the body. So it's bringing a new layer to reality. And you can read it. If you can read the, the, the positioning of this uh, scarification, you can read it like a code of arm in Europe. You know what the social position is, but also what kind of life journey they went through. And the re one of the reasons that women wear this scarification is because according to certain, um, uh, say that, ethnical groups, um, and when I use the term ethnical groups, I don't want to be pejorative. It's just a technical term just to point out, uh, uh, yeah, a group of a certain community. Um, is that only women were allowed to go through that initiation rituals. And the further they got in their life, they went to a second initiation and got more markings. But they considered that the woman was the only person, human being, capable of bearing a child, going through a very hell's, uh, hellish pain <laughs> process. And she was only the one, only noble enough and strong enough to go through that initiation ritual. And what I wanted to, to explain at the end is look at our ancestry, but also it's a projection of the future, towards the future. How Afro-Europeans or hybrid beings, people with fluid ident identities could be represented through photography. And life is always complex and multi-layered. And it's also represented throughout uh, into that technique of uh, building up layers over, uh, uh, over each other. And it's when you look at the reality, um, I mean, it's also built up of layers. It's like a membrane, it's like a skin. You know, in, in Europe, there is that, that whole discussion about uh, what to do with colonial monuments, monuments celebrating colonial, uh, the colonial past and achievements and colonial heroes who killed a lot of black people just to take over the ivory business or mines or just take political control of a region to enslave people. And, uh, oh Jesus, I lost my track, sorry. I'm so, <laughs> such a... <laughs> we were talking about this um, idea of, of you proposing this as kind of a futuristic identity, um, but at the same time, um, linking it to um, current ideas around monuments oh uh, yes yeah, all of yeah. monuments correct yeah you know you could say okay we want to take out of the public space certain monuments because they celebrate like king leopold ii who was uh i mean a mass killer um but is that the right thing because then there is an opportunity to fals falsify our history you know, there are enough right-wing groups ready to falsify history through the social media, but I think it's important to maintain certain anchor points in the urbanist and the cityscape, you know? In the, so we, 
we still remember, I recognize pain and suffering and colonization and imperialism by eyesight. But it's possible to build a new layer on top of these monuments. For example, with Kwanga, Kwanga skin can be used to put a new layer that is uh, critical to the, under, the, the layer underneath. For example, a statue of King Leopold II, you could uh, bring a layer of white rubber to cover it and to create a new character, impersonating a more uh, inclusive society, a, a new uh, hero for, an, for a hybrid and fluid uh, future. And it's that's the same principle of working in layers to be critical to the, to the, to the, to the down layer, the, 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 the layer underneath. But if you totally erase the reflection and, uh, that was existing in, in, in Flanders represented, uh, represented in these paintings, uh, how that was the dominating uh, Flemish cultural view, not taking in consideration that they were also foreigners in their, uh, in their city. It's a way to, to, to critique a society view that is on the lower layer. And you build up different layers without uh, totally, uh, um, you say that, covering the, 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 the layers underneath. Thank you. Wow, <laughs> an, elaborate, an elaborate description and interesting also again, proposal of, of, of how to deal with history, in a sense, the history that was written by some old victors. Um, okay, Johan. So can you elaborate a little bit around this uh, work? Because this work is, um, as shown here, um, placed adjacent to, to this uh, proposed futuristic um, character uh, by, uh, by um, Roland. Can you just, I guess for me, what was interesting was um, one, that it was a collaborative piece, two, um, that um, the story behind it also um, for me was interesting because it does speak to being um, also quite open um, to, uh, to missteps, I guess, or to misconstruing uh, stories and narratives. Um, uh, yeah, and, and, and how um, it is through conversations, I guess, artistic conversation with fellow artists in Kinsani that you, you decided to very publicly and openly uh, present this. Go ahead. Yeah, you know, uh, I just realized now that um, based on what um, Roland just said about the danger of uh, kind of um, cleaning up history if you just want to remove everything that's bad. Yeah, that um, erasure. Yeah. yeah, it's interesting because um, it, this work actually ends up looking like something that almost comments on that of like... Um, if you think of this idea of cancel culture, this idea that everything is that is bad, you just want to cancel out kind of thing. And it's this image ended up looking almost as if um, there's a there's there's a risk or like of canceling out of erasing an important kind of um, history, as in like we need to know how bad slavery was. We need to know how uh, our histories and, and heritage is kind of intertwined with that and so on. Um, so, <clears throat> so that's kind of preempting, that's the preempting the work now. To go back to where it comes from. Um, so I mentioned earlier, one of the reasons I like to accentuate Afrikaansness is, um, is that in itself, it's got so much duality, but the other big reason is because there is so much um, engagement uh, that needs to happen, that has not yet happened uh, between white Afrikaans people and the rest of South Africa. And so uh, by kind of boldly and overtly, overtly putting myself out there, I actually feel like 
more opportunities are created for these things to be kind of dealt with. So um, I've had a couple of opportunities to work collaboratively with um, black artists that are, are around my age. And I always find it, uh, well, in each case, I've found it extremely um, enriching. It's like every time my way of thinking gets challenged, um, every time I realize something that should be very obvious and has been in front of my eyes all along, but I was not able to see it. And um, so in this particular case, I was working for a group show um, that we were um, paired up uh, to, to make collaborative pieces specifically. And in preparation for that, I started with a drawing that I thought would I would just bring into the conversation. And it's based on an image that um, actually a friend of mine was traveling in, I think in Tanzania, and he sent me this picture from a museum that he visited, the slave, slavery museum. And it was this image. And I remember it just really upset me a lot. And I felt like uh, kind of righteously, um, but it's kind of actually self-righteously empowered to um, make this image that expresses this, this severe um, dissatisfaction and anger in a way. And I thought the idea I had was really good. <laughs> I thought it was very smart. And um, so the idea was to take this image I had of a um, uh, of this slave that had uh, uh, it's like it's like a chain but made out of wood. I'm not sure what you call it around his neck. And the idea was to replace it with a rope, actually, and also to um, which you don't see, can't see anymore in this image. He also he not only had a, a rope around his neck, he also had a, a suicide vest on. And I wanted to express this idea of um, like the, there's a, there's a reasonable link between um, anger towards kind of Europe or people or whatever, and you know, the histories behind it or the stories behind it, even the, well, especially actually contemporary stories behind it. And um, so I thought it would be interesting to make this image and I thought it would be a really smart title to call, to call it, I hate you rope as if he's talking to the rope at Europe. And I made the image and I also included, which is something I like to do, I included a, an explosive um, element. So some of the image was actually, before the, these paper components came, um, it was actually, uh, part of the image was actually blown off. The chalk was blown off the image. Um, and it was like a prank. Like I pranked my my colleague when he came in, I lit the match when he came into my studio, and um, and so we we talked about we looked at the work and we talked about it, and we talked about it, and I realized that it's really really bad. <laughs> I realized that um, I kind of it because I was kind of emotional about a, a subject. I veered away from my um, usual course of sticking to something that has got nuance and kind of an element of duality to it. And even though there was this smart element that at the time I even thought was humorous, it wasn't really humorous actually. And, um, and so this whole work ended up about, it, it ended up being about the experience of uh, tackling a tough subject, putting your awkward self out there, and then finding out, wow, you're very wrong about this and that. You are very inappropriate to kind of assume that you can speak for someone else on a certain subject. And, um, and then I, I basically gave this over, but not like gave over and went away, but I kind of gave control of the work over to Kinsani Rechlam for who I was working with. And it was quite literally like um, 
this we're going to erase this work and we were some of the stuff that we were working with with the other pieces included this this little bits of paper and stuff and i think it was kind of like an intuitive thing you just stuck these bits of paper on it and then i i you know it started looking really interesting to me because it um it to, now it looks more like like an exemplification of of how history can be misrepresented you know <clears throat> by people wanting to maybe even with good intentions wanting to really say that this is how it is and kind of trying to push an agenda while um while telling history and then in the process you kind of um, you're actually not doing the good thing that you thought you were doing and um so just the way it looks there to me kind of captures something about what you realize when you read history and it's written in this very didactic way and it's telling you this and this and this and you start realizing oh actually actually the truth is somewhere in between the lines you know it's actually when you when you shake this firmament of um of right and wrong and this kind of morally correct uh, or proper or appropriate way of telling a story um when you kind of shake yourself loose from from that you you might find the truth in this very like to borrow a word from roland fluid kind of form or kind of more alive in between form. so but i don't know i'd like to i'd really like to know what roland thinks about it no really? <laughs> yeah i was thinking about <laughs> about your your work generally what I like about it, it has such a serious tone. I mean, because you're using these classical codes and it seems like they look very serious. You need very, you need an analytical uh, re reasoning, Ali, I mean, uh, to, to kind of deconstruct the meaning until you get to these elements that diffuse uh, and create uh, your certainty about what it's about and create ambiguity. And um, yeah, I, th I think the, also the aspect of humor, I think it's very relevant to be, uh, you know, I kind of sell my perspectives as being well-researched and very serious. I think um, that's a very relevant perspective towards the world and so, but honestly, uh, I'm also, I use a lot of humor because I think, I, I don't owe the truth, you know, I don't own the truth. I, I, there are so many perspectives perspective next to mine that, that are, deserve the same kind of uh, attention and so on. And, uh, but about ambiguity, I think it's, it looks like such a very serious work. I mean, very well taught and so clear and um, I just love it. Can you explain why did you cross through it and write cancelled? Uh, that was that was concerning, but I I think we spoke about it. It's like okay, let's cross it out. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it's it's um, uh, the title is title retracted because the the the, the original idea was that mm -hmm. the there was some humor in the in the title, and then I realized that it's only humorous because I'm ignorant and insensitive. Mm -hmm. It's actually not, it's, it's not humorous at all. Yeah. And so, so this work, we decided to make it serious and to take out that humorous element. Yeah. And that was kind of like the, the learning moment for me. So, um, so it was like, it was like, a, it was like a, in your mind, when you when you make something and you say this is art, this is my art, this is the piece, and this was a way of saying, not this piece is the piece, kind of thing. It's like yeah, saying, I think sometimes I think sorry to interrupt, but I do think sometimes um, artists do um, need to take responsibility and also be taken to task 
uh, by others when especially because it becomes um, a perspective in a it's not a it becomes a perspective that is publicly <clears throat> seen and 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 perpetuated um i do believe that yeah the responsibility is both one of the public and one of of um of the artist it lies between and in the hidden spaces and in the gaps and um so i, yeah, I it's it's not like it's uh, i must also say it's not like my friend was angry and he said we can't do this no, it was actually a it was actually very gracious. I just wanted to mention that. It's like a, it was actually quite a very gracious act that he was like. It almost felt to me more like he was, he was because it was not only my colleague, it was my friend as well, and it didn't phase him at all that I made this misstep. It, we approach it more like, like you would art. It's like oh no, that yeah. that you should erase that, but it doesn't look good. And but it was dealing with something very serious. So um, yeah. I also wasn't referring to the cancel culture in a sense, but it really is. Um, it, it's a wonderful, it's a wonderful act of uh, friendship and and um, and vulnerability and and learning yeah. uh, in so many ways. Yeah. So, so the reason I'm also saying I'm interested to see what people see in it is because. Um, I realized that those particular steps are not necessarily explicitly in the work. It's it's just like we, we I was kind of hoping that um, if you've gone through the process of earnestly trying to make something good and you've gone through a journey and the work is just somehow the result of the evidence of that journey, there's also like a kind of a hope that it somehow contains something good in it now. Which is what I, which is what I believe is present here. But it's like I can only tell you what happened. I don't really. I had this very specific idea. It was a bad idea. That's what. Happened. So I'm not sure it was a bad idea. It was just part of the process. I, yes. Exactly. You finished. You completed the process. And you know what? I also feel what I like about that is it reminds me of the collaboration between Warhol and uh, Basquiat where Warhol has a very illustrative, uh, like a, a very perfect, like a, a very interesting, uh, perfect position and composition, where uh, Basquiat kind of erased things to um, cover with a thick, uh, 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 say that, layer of paint just to reveal more. Mm. So I think mm. crossing through something, erasing something sometimes just Raise more. Yeah, of, uh, yeah, yeah. Exactly. I like that about it. That work. Oh, you see, I knew there was something here. <laughs> <laughs> Gentlemen, we are kind of drawing to a close uh, in our conversation, and I wanted to ask so many more questions, but um, alas, uh, perhaps, um, perhaps in another format, perhaps in a, in a, I don't know, uh, in, in person kind of, mm -hmm. you can see Maybe each other across the halls. But can I just briefly uh, take a look at um, perhaps the, the, the uh, Q&A and if there is any, um, yeah, a fellow artist who has just asked, um, I was curious to know what text was used in the collaboration. Looks like a religious text. Was wondering if there was also a significant role that language played in the collaboration. Was it a kind of ode? Or, I don't know, I hope that's what uh, Nyakalo Maleke um, is asking. Uh, can you unmute Sorry. yourself? Yeah, sorry. You know, that's a, that's a very good um, question because it's actually something that I've forgotten and it's a pity because I never wrote it down. But now that they ask a question, I do remember um, that it was a specific book that um, Kinsani was working out of, that he was tearing pages out of. And unfortunately, all I can give you is kind of like the sense of what I can remember of what significance of that book was because I remember it was actually something quite specific um, it was like a, either it was um, 
a, a textbook or it was like a religious text, like a Bible, but I think actually it was like a textbook, but um, uh, it was. Font seems very, very small for textbook and very consistent kind of, a, yeah. Um, but I remember thinking um, that it was, uh, so now I'm think, I'm think it was Zulu, but I'm actually not sure. I just feel embarrassed for my ignorance here. But um, I remember thinking that there was something really nice about um, uh, it not being, it being something like a text that looks like a, it was kind of like a classic old textbook, but it was in a, a, a African language. And so, which is, it shouldn't be, that, that in itself shouldn't even be, be special, but it did feel like, um, to me, it felt like a nice twist on um, what you usually expect, at least when my eyes, what my eyes typically expect from a book like that. And then to see it in this very well um, laid out uh, African language, you know, it's similar to what Roland was saying, like this, it shouldn't be news for us, but it's news for us to hear, oh, they were African civilizations. Oh wow, they were African intellectuals. It's like <laughs> it shouldn't be. We should know this because it's just true. But um, but it's actually a nice touch because it, it plays on that. Uh, it helps kind of um, prod or, or shake loose that preconceived idea. But I should I should ask. I'll talk to Kinsani and just find out exactly what book that was because I I remember him using it kind of like very purposefully, like he had a get a connection to that book actually. Sorry, I say I'm Zoom says I'm this question. The buttons here. Um, I see Zoom says this question has been answered. So I guess yes. the answer was good enough. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> um, Gentlemen, do you have any questions for me as, as, as the curator that we could very briefly, I don't know, talk about, or are you quite comfortable and clear in the context in which your work was presented? I'm honestly, uh, I have no questions. I, I told you what I already gave you my feedback on, on the exhibition, but I just wonder how the public experience like this, this combination and conversation between these uh, different artworks and uh... mm, So what uh, we have only had one uh, physical public uh, presentation of the show, which was the opening, we are going to have another one. Um, on Saturday, more guided in the sense that I was uh, present there. Um, of course, the public is able to access the space at any one time uh, during working hours during the week. But the response was um, was very interesting in that uh, people did have a lot of questions around your work, Roland, and especially the idea around the hair. Uh, the presence of the wig. Um, they have one of the ways of encouraging participation on part of the audience was also to ask people to write uh, on the wall ideas uh, that they had when they, how they read the work, as well as if there were any emotions that um, were elicited while looking at the work, as a way of, of, of just not uh, perceiving the images as uh, in a didactic kind of way. So in other words, you know, you see uh, what you get and, and, and that's its interpretation that, you know, that one can dig beyond it. Um, so um, I can only say that uh, some of the questions were very intriguing. Um, audiences were almost sometimes also prompted um, to interface with it uh, by me um, and by others. Um, but in general, I can, I can say that it was a very positive uh, response. I don't think that the, the, 
the nuanced nature um, was elaborated on as much as this, for instance, conversation has. So I hope that you know people will spend another hour and a half listening to us in this recording. <laughs> but I, uh, what I just wanted to add, my work is quite uh, multi-layered and I, I yeah. like uh, as much the concept and the, the, the construction of the concept, like, like a mental sculpture as the, um, the realization of it, the production of the, of the end product. But at the end, I think it's really important. And I think that uh, Johan also said that uh, I'm curious just to see what people see in them. And uh, they, sh they don't need that, na that whole narrative, uh, yeah. the first contact. Right. I You're find right. it really enriching just to hear from them that they discover something else and new perspectives. And I, yeah. I don't, I think, mean, yeah. The elaboration that they made was through short sentences. So I will make sure that um, I post um, the statement yeah. alongside uh, your work. Great. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Sarah, I don't know whether you are there. Mm, I am. But... <laughs> I'm <actually listening laughs> <in the> background. <laughs> Um, thank you very much. I think it's been a really interesting um, and enlightening experience. I mean, I think as much as I've spoken to both Johan and Roland about their work in general, it's been really nice to like pick some specific instances and it's given me loads of kind of more things to think about, not just in terms of the work, but as the exhibition as a whole. Fantastic. Sarah, I really would like to thank you publicly also for uh, facilitating um, this showing for the talk tonight um, under the auspices of uh, the Meta Foundation and August House, but also under the auspices of Sarah Hallett, uh, because without the individual, there wouldn't be any of this. Um, yeah, thank you very much. And uh, Roland and Johan, thank you also. Uh, for the conversation and um, yeah, I hope that this continues um, over a glass of wine the next time. Oh yes, I hope that. <laughs> I also want, guys, I also want to thank you, Sarah and the Meta Foundation for and and, and Maria to to organize this whole uh, experience and yeah. and uh, I I feel sorry I, I'm not in Johannesburg to see that, but uh, I can enjoy the the I, I certainly advise people to do the. 3D tour. It's really interesting. Mm. Thank you. So, yes, that was one thing I should have also mentioned. Yeah. <laughs> from my side, from my side as well, I just want to say thanks a lot. This was a really well organized um, exhibition. I'm really impressed, and uh, thanks for, for for putting me next to Roland's work. I think that was like a, that's a very good example of what a curator can do. Like I would not have had this kind of fruitful engagement and a perspective to think through my work if it if you didn't do this so thank you really for the honest, honestly, <laughs> <laughs> what you just said is right it's the same for me and i think we just uh we'll keep on this uh we continue this conversation once we yes. have a moment to get together and uh that is ultimately <laughs> the goal yes. that would be great yeah, yeah. <laughs> fantastic Thank you. Thank you all. And um, I guess I, I need to bid everyone good night. Good night. Bye. Good night, Thank everyone. you so much, everybody. Bye. Have a good evening. <laughs> you too. Bye. Ciao. Bye.